There's a general tendency to consider Italy as a land of art, beauty, and aesthetics, and rightly so. There's nothing wrong with that, but it would certainly be false to reduce Italians to a people of artists, intellectuals, and humanists. Or even worse, to reduce culture to an abstract endeavor. Now, and I might shock you here, I honestly think that what sets Italians apart is instead the mastery of materials and the material world. Think how much Italians have excelled since the Renaissance in the art of stone or wood carving, in the crafts of tailoring, in the design of iron, in glass blowing, or in fabric dyeing, where, for example, the Medici's or the Rucellai's made their fortune in Florence. But let me take it even further. Italians also excel in the actual production of materials like rubber or steel. We rarely associate Italy with steel, but this is what I want to discuss with you today. It might seem an oxymoron, but in this episode, we'll be dealing with Italian steel and why Italians are at the top in the world's production of quality steel. Just as a premise to reinforce what I said, a cultural history of Italy through materials would be a fascinating chapter to explore maybe a book project for the future, who knows? Just to give you an idea of what I mean, think of asphalt, a key ingredient for roads, which in the public discourse of the early 20th century became a symbol of the new power of modernity to level uneven terrains, connect distant places, and smoothen ge geographical asperity. We discussed in episode 10 on Edoardo Bianchi how bicycles promoted travel and the related necessity of roads and infrastructures. Another interesting material is aluminum, which the fascist propaganda turned into an iconic metal to cover up for the unavailability of supplies in Italy. In episode 7 on Alfonso Bialetti, we talked about how its two varieties, light and anti-corrosive, embody the political discourse symbolizing the regime's supposed lightness and resistance to deterioration. Think then of rubber, which became the key element for telegraphic communications and wheel mobility. In the Bianchi episode, we talked about Pirelli, Italy's greatest producer of rubber, who first converted it from a key insulating material for telegraphic wires into a key element for tires. Oil, too, became a symbolic material, especially in the post-war years, when the discovery of oil fields in the southern region of Basilicata by the Italian National Oil Company, ENI, created a real frenzy. The finding stirred Italy's dreams of economic self-reliance in the years of the economic boom and significantly led to a related cultural production as witnessed in the investment by any manager, Enrico Mattei, in the creation of educational movies for the Italian TV Rai, based on masterpieces of Italian literature, as well as by the novel Petrolio, Oil, by the internationally acclaimed writer and director Pierpaolo Pasolini, published posthumously in 1992. Last but not least, in the 1960s, and this does not apply only to Italy, the introduction of plastics completely changed our relationship to objects. Before then, an object was conserved and retained for a lifetime, whereas plastics introduced the new logic of convenience and consumption, which is at the heart of industrial waste. Plastics gave fluidity in the shaping of objects, yet created a cycle of endless consumption without retention which is at the origin of the ideology of consumerism. The passage from endless consumption to endless waste led to the fashioning of a new industrial and cultural attention to trash as an industry of disposal and recycling and as a literary symbol, for example, in the postmodern discourse. Now, finally, steel. Steel is the basic element behind skyscrapers. Steel has resistance and flexibility, but above all, steel gives the advantage of verticality. 
That's why it became a key material in the US after the invention of the elevator in 1852, which modified the previous horizontality of architecture and spurred the vertical development of modern cities. The upward urge granted by steel is also behind the evolution of the so-called commercial style, developing in St. Louis, Chicago, and New York in the early 1890s as the first non-imported American style of architecture, which combined the synthesis of monetary investment, industrial might, and cultural self-confidence as expressing the babelic form of the skyscraper. We are used to relating steel to America and not to Italy, right? Well, moving back to our present, here is something that might counter this assumption. You might be familiar with the new development in the Hudson Yards on the west side of Manhattan. You might have seen its most iconic building, the Vessel, which is a labyrinth of staircases intersecting in a complex beehive structure. What you might not be familiar with, however, is the fact that the Vessel, by the English architect Thomas Heatherwick, is entirely built with Italian steel. Yes, Italian steel. Why? Why would Americans ship Italian steel across the Atlantic rather than producing it? This is today's story. The success story of Armando Cimolai and his company, which became an international leader in the production of high-quality steel. Who is this man? Even Italians would have a hard time recognizing his name. If you read about him, he is now in his 90s. His life has nothing surprising in appearance. He was born in 1929 in the northeastern region of Friuli, Venezia Giulia, bordering Austria and Slovenia. In 1951, he married his wife, Albina, and they had three children. A half century later, in 2005, the University of Trieste conferred upon him an honorary degree, and the President of the Italian Republic made him Great Official of Italy for his merits. What happened in between? What was at the heart of the life of Il Signor Armando, Mr. Armando, as he still likes to be called? The story of his life is the story of his company. Judging from its growth, then one can easily compare him to a sea captain, navigating the uncharted waters of his business with determination, passion, industriousness, and the burning desire to achieve. The company started in 1949, when Armando opened a small workshop to produce steel gates and windows. From then to now, when Cimolai Incorporated has about 2,000 employees and a revenue of about 700 million euros, Signor Armando's entrepreneurial path has been that of a constant and slow expansion. At the beginning, Cimolai produced materials for, for the military. Then, it started building fabrication facilities for the family business, but also for other Italian industries, including Fiat and Zanussi. In 1963, Cimolai first expanded with the building of a new facility fully equipped with technologically advanced installations and machinery. Then, in 1974, Cimolai opened another plant near Pordenone, and in 1985, another workshop, and in 1991, the service center. With its fabrication capability, the company's reputation of professionalism and reliability also expanded, granting it bigger projects of stadiums, bridges, and aircraft shelters in Italy and abroad. As the company has expanded in recent years, it has also acquired other mechanical producers like Fabris and ZM, and created an affiliated headquarters in Chelyabinsk, Russia, as well as an affiliated company in Abu Dhabi. While completing the certification process to meet environmental standards in all its production sites, Chimolai now has a threefold organization, dealing with di three different areas of production curtain walls, components for the oil and gas industry, and the assembling of heavy structures. Now, even in this incredible expansion across a global horizon, Chimolai's production 
does not remain horizontal, flattened on a purely economic growth, standard assembly line, or bare materialism, so just producing steel. What characterizes it the most, instead, is actually the insistence on a vertical dimension, on quality and aesthetics of production as a way to elevate pure and, if you will, brutal construction to the realm of beauty and to public good. What is striking in Chimolai, indeed, is its absolute audacity in creating daring and awe-inspiring steel structures. Not just the materials behind construction, but materials at the service of aesthetic utility or useful aesthetics, as witnessed in his worldwide work on stadiums, bridges, towers, canals, transportation hubs, and ships. So the concreteness of steel, but also the Italian gusto, quality, and taste for inventive creativeness. It all goes back to the heart and life experience of Il Signor Armando. Armando certainly has the artisanal tradition in his blood, as someone whose large hands are used to make things. Maybe this goes back to Signor Armando's grandfather, who was a maestro in the Venice Arsenale, a renowned shipyard that even Dante admires with awe in Canto 21 of the Inferno in his Divine Comedy. The other core quality of Mr. Armando is the resilience of his work and a rootedness in his land, what the medieval monks called the stabilitas loci, the stability of place, which made him refuse to live freely for Canada or Australia, as his father did when he worked in the motor industry in Detroit. Starting from his land, he would direct mind-blowing projects all over the world. Here are a few, just to give you an idea of his importance. So bridges, in Padua, Reggio Emilia, Rome, but also the upcoming Garden Bridge across the Thames River in London, a structure designed by Thomas Etherwick, made of steel plate clad with copper and nickel, produced in Friuli and shipped via boat. Stations. Cimolai helped to construct the Reggio Emilia high-speed train station in Italy with its wave-like roof and contributed to the Tiburtina station in Rome and the World Trade Center New Transportation Hub in New York. If you fly to Rome, the terminal in the Fiumicino airport is also made with Cimolai steel. Towers and stadiums, so the Sports City Tower in Doha, Qatar, and the upcoming Intesa San Paolo Tower in Milan, but also the Olympic Stadium of Athens in 2004, the National Stadiums of Luxembourg, Warsaw, and Brasilia, and for you soccer lovers, the Millennium Stadium in Cardiff, where the 2017 Champions League final was played. I won't go too much into details of the game here. Lastly, Chimulai is producing the steel for the project of the enlargement of the Panama Canal, which is underway. In all this, his philosophy of work has remained the same, based on a profound positivity as confirmed in a recent interview. E per fare l'imprenditore bisogna avere tanto coraggio e tanto entusiasmo. To be an entrepreneur, one needs to have a lot of courage and a lot of enthusiasm, he says. And hearing this from someone who is in his 90s, it's not hard to recognize that positivity is not cheap optimism, but rather a courageous enthusiasm, rooted in the pride for a recognized history in a given deposit of traditions and in the passion for work, which also translates into esteem for the work of others, as witnessed by the fact that Chimolai has never laid anyone off over the course of his career. His work ethic is well represented in a recent interview. When referring to young professionals, he identified labor as the key element for a path of success. And I quote here, I'm concerned for youth in the labor market. To them, I recommend to accept whatever opportunity in as much as it is work, because any work has something useful to learn, skills that might be used again in the future, when one will be able to choose a position 
which is more suitable to his or her inclinations, end quote. As someone whose first job was teaching Microsoft Word to sixth graders in my Italian hometown, I can't help but see the value of this statement. I might also add, pursue what is distinctive in you, even if it is in a niche. It's much better than doing a mediocre or unsatisfying job in a more lucrative industry or field. In this sense, the story of Chimolai is a testimony to the value of entrepreneurship as an adventure built on dreams, tenacity, but also on one's innermost talents and interests. Now, here is your Italian summary for today. Keep in mind that acciaio is the Italian word for steel. Cimolai è un grande produttore italiano di acciaio. La sua industria produce acciaio di qualità per ponti, stadi, strutture architettoniche e ora anche per l'allargamento del canale di Panama. La sua produzione si fonda sul lavoro, sull'arte e sulla qualità. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at IT8 Innovators for updates about the podcast, additional contents and much more. Thanks for listening. Arrivederci e alla prossima.